Hey everybody, happy Thursday. Thank you for joining our um, SageMaker webinar. Today we're going to cover latent Dirichlet allocation and uh, I think I pasted the pronunciation of that fun German word into the chat if anybody's really interested in hearing it a few times. Um, my name is Sue Ewig and I'm the AWS Global Partner Marketing Manager for AI and Machine Learning and I want to welcome all of our AWS Machine Learning Competency Consulting Partners today. Our presenter for today is Pratap Ramamurthy, and you guys have heard of uh, heard from Pratap before on multiple topics. He's a partner solutions architect um, who works with our partners, helping them build their solutions on, on AWS. He works, um, obviously, with partners who specialize in machine learning and AI solutions. He's got a particular interest in natural language processing and um, always a great presenter on these topics. Joining Pratap is Chris Burns, who you guys also know. He's going to help get your questions answered. So um, as per usual, there is the right navigation pane as that's part of the GoToWebinar application. Um, you can find the Q&A section in that pane and just pop your questions in there. Um, and Chris and Pratap will get them addressed during the call. So let's jump right in. Uh, Pratap, take it away. Well, thanks, Sue. Um, good morning, folks, um, and happy Thursday. Um, today, we are going to be looking at uh, latent Dirichlet allocation. Um, we were just making jokes about this. Uh, a lot of people call this Dirichlet, Dirichlet. Um, I, we thought it was French. It looks like uh, uh, this, is a, uh, this is a guy who was uh, German. So to, to, to avoid any of these uh, 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 confusion about the pronunciation, let's just call it LDA. That's the most common way to... Uh, pronounce this. Um, this is one of the algorithms that are uh, built into SageMaker uh, that you can use today. All right. Um, this is a series uh, just for folks who are new to this uh, webinar. Um, the, what you're hearing today is the uh, uh, I think the eighth, um, ninth webinar uh, in the series where we're discussing about Amazon algorithms that's available through uh, SageMaker. Um, today it's LDA. Um, and you have four more lined up, and you may be hearing from Sue about uh, the more uh, webinars that are to come. All right. So what are Amazon algorithms? I, I just threw that in. Uh, what is an Amazon algorithm? Uh, these are popular algorithms um, that are already being used um, uh, in the community. Uh, these are completely rewritten by Amazon. Um, and the main thing is they are optimized to run on AWS, and they are um, and they are mainly rewritten to scale uh, uh, to web level scales. It's consumed as a service. Um, uh, you do not download uh, the algorithm. It's uh, this is the cloud model where uh, you throw in data and then you just subscribe to this, uh, this algorithm and uh, you, you consume. This is a service where the AWS trains it for you. And these uh, algorithms are available through SageMaker. Um, Amazon SageMaker is our main machine learning platform um, on AWS. Okay. Um, all right. So today we're talking about LDA. This is a very specific algorithm that solves a very specific problem. Um, and what is it used for? It's specifically usually used in uh, text uh, or natural language processing or computational linguistics, um, as I like to call it. Um, it does a few things. It is used not just for that, but the most popular use case for LDA is what is called topic modeling. Um, I'm going to be explaining to you what topic modeling is. Um, that is uh, this this actually the, the first use case for topic modeling um, was actually published in the year 2004. There is a paper uh, by the very popular deep learning scientist Andrew Ng. You probably have heard of him. Um, and this was the uh, one of the uh, um, uh, this very seminal paper that started new new uh, research around LDA and statistical modeling on text. Um, it's also used for text analytics. Um, I'll, I'll be describing what topic modeling is in the next few slides, but let's look at others as well. It's also used to uh, understand text. That is, uh, let's say you have a large corpus of uh, text data. Let's say you have uh, um, you have crawled the web and you have uh, you know, billions of documents. You want to understand like what kinds of documents there are. Um, so that it's, it's used for that as well. Text clustering. Um, topic modeling is actually this. Um, it's actually a way to cluster text. Let's say you have a, a million different documents in your company uh, and you want to kind of cluster them in a certain way um, and understand what kind of clusters exist. 
so you could use LDA. Um, you can also use this for automated tag creation. Um, so it's, we're moving from analytics to more um, uh, proactive uses of this. For example, let's say you have a blog platform and you have uh, your users creating blogs. You can use LDA to automatically attach tags to these new blogs that they're writing. Um, and uh, the, this, is, this is using the algorithm. Um, the, third, the, the, uh, the fifth use case here is recommendation engines. Uh, LDA can also be used because it's, it helps you cluster documents um, uh, uh, into uh, clusters based on topics. You could use this to um, say that, hey, I, I, a, a, a document when it belongs to a cluster um, or a topic, you can then start to recommend other documents that belong to the same topic. So that's, that's one use case here. Uh, text dimensionality reduction. So this is dimensionality reduction. You might have heard of PCA, principal component analysis, for uh, structured data. Um, doing that for text is not trivial. It's, it cannot apply PCA in, on text. Um, uh, uh, so what you could do is use LDA to uh, reduce the dimensionality and make it into a structured uh, context. Then you can uh, you have a way to uh, uh, to transform the the, the text documents uh, into a structured format. And now it's much more amenable for more analysis. Um, and it, you could actually also use it for population genetics. Uh, what it means is, let's say you have DNA sequences of a population. You can run LDA to find these patterns or clusters of DNA sequences among a large population. Um, you could also, for example, let's say you have DNA samples of a thousand different uh, organisms. You can use LDA to actually find out uh, the species. Um, and the clusters of uh, species uh, in uh, in that subpopulation of thousand. So this is this is use, some of the use cases for LDA. Um, in the in the last case, uh, you can imagine the DNA sequences to be just like text. Uh, you have the uh, the four uh, molecules in a DNA. If you arrange that in a certain way, you have the um, you have a, something like a text. So these are these are very large number of use cases for LDA, um, and it's very actively used. Okay, so now let's look at what LDA is, and I'm going to be focusing on my attention on the text analytics, right, um, or the uh, uh, NLP use cases. But before we go into NLP, I want you guys to understand uh, the problem. Like, what is the problem it's trying to solve, and why is it difficult, so that you can appreciate this. So here's, but before we go into text, let's first analyze how it works. Um, with just two-dimensional data, right? This is two-dimensional data, um, and uh, you, you have x-axis going from, you have two variables, x and y, right? Uh, every data point has x comma y, um, and uh, x goes from zero to one, or y, and y goes from zero to one, and you have this distribution, right? I've color-coded this for you because it's synthetically generated data, uh, but it, it, this looks like a Mickey Mouse. This is a very popular way of uh, testing an algorithm. Uh, you, you have the Mickey Mouse phase in two years, but Immediately, as soon as you look at this, our human visual uh, uh, cortex is able to identify three clusters, right? You have the blue cluster, green cluster, and the red cluster. Um, not just that, um, you, uh, you also note that the, uh, the, the red and the green clusters are is a lot more dense than the blue cluster, right? So you have the, uh, the blue cluster that's much larger, um, and but it's spread out uh, over a larger area, whereas the green and the red clusters are are um, are are more dense, right? So we are able to immediately uh, distinguish these three distinct clusters, um, and you can see that there are some places where they do overlap, right? Now, uh, if you have an algorithm, if you have a clustering algorithm that you run on this, um, uh, you have what what you would ident identify is that you first need to identify the centers of these clusters. That's a, that's a, so you know you know that there are three clusters. Like say you, you, you want to give the algorithm um, uh, the number, right? There's, the, you're telling the algorithm that there are three clusters and you want them to, want it to identify this. And you want to expect the, the model or algorithm to find out two things about the clusters, right? You want them to, you want the algorithm to identify the centers of the clusters. I think in this case it's marked by a cross 
uh, in the middle of the blue cluster and you can see a large circle in the middle of the green cluster and you can also see uh, an indication of a of a of a black a square uh, cross in the middle of the red cluster so the first thing to identify is the centers of these clusters also um you uh, you want to identify the distribution uh, or other properties of this distribution right so you have the uh, uh standard deviation or variance which also needs to be identified um and so when you have this that is what is called a statistical model you you're building a statistical model from this data set right now let's see an example of um uh, of an of a, of, a, of an algorithm that we we usually see um uh, in structured data this is this this when this data is run by k means clustering you notice that how it is clustered right um the the central um uh, cluster is now split into three pieces and what what k means clustering usually does is it splits the data set into into three equal parts um and uh, that this does not make sense here because um uh, you have now the face of mickey mouse being split into three um there's some blue uh, blue distribution blue cluster now coming into the face and green cluster coming into the face not just that the centers of the green cluster and the blue cluster are now moved away from the real centers into somewhere in the middle um obviously you cannot just run an algorithm like k means clustering which only identifies the centers of uh, clusters right so you need to uh, have a more sophisticated uh, algorithm that can really properly identify the centers and other properties of the model right so as you can see the even even with the small uh, use case of a small dimensional this is just two dimensional data two dimensional data uh, we need to be careful about um, uh, finding out the uh, clusters of data now imagine when you have a a, a space that has 100000 dimensions and now you want to uh, understand the clusters in this very large space and that is the problem uh, space in natural language processing where each word in a language uh, is a different dimension and so when you take the vocabulary of a language like english which has about 400000 words uh, on an average um uh, depending on the corpus you have a very high dimensional space and you want to make sure that you understand like what is going on and have a right uh, scalable algorithm that predicts the uh, clusters for you right so what is topic modeling right let's go into topic modeling what we looked at was structured data and just very low dimensional data now let's look at a really high dimensional data and see how it works right so imagine the topic modeling is a very specific problem in natural language processing what topic modeling does is let's say you have thousands of documents um this actually was is the case with wikipedia uh the original andrew ings paper was actually trying to solve wikipedia's problem where they had um they had millions of documents uh wikipedia pages and and now they want to cluster them into topics right you have a you need you need some kind of a clustering some kind of a way to organize the the pages to be make make wikipedia useful so they do run uh, lda um uh, uh to cluster uh, the Uh, pages for example you have uh, let's say you have the documents about computer science uh, you have documents about philosophy you have documents about chemistry um these are all clustered based on the lda algorithm right so that is the problem of topic modeling you have a large number of documents individual documents um that could have uh, that could be talking about a few topics like uh, for example one document could be talking about two different topics um uh, not just one topic for example i could be talking i could write a blog post about cars and philosophy right driving cars may be a very uh, philosophical experience for me or a spiritual experience for me so i could be talking about both cars and spirituality in the same uh, document so what what this is what what this uh, uh, brings is uh, we are going to be clustering the documents into topics and the uh, and the assumption is that the documents do not have are not talking about a large number of topics but only a few number of topics that's an important assumption here so in the bottom we see examples of three different documents um so the first document on the left side is this leadership uh talking about maybe improving leadership skills and uh, demonstrating them the second is uh committee and structure the epa this is more of a a uh, legal document or maybe uh, a documentation on 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 a on a committee um third is heavy metal poisoning maybe a brochure or a warning 
Um, so these are these are talking about three distinct topics. Um, uh, but uh, now we want to what we want to do is we want to run an algorithm that automatically identifies the topics. One of the important things about LDA or topic modeling is that you do not tell the algorithm what the topics are. This is an unsupervised algorithm. Um, because it's, for example, if you take Wikipedia, uh, we have millions of documents. You don't want somebody sitting there, uh, you don't want volunteers to tell you what the topics are because it's a very time consuming process and it's also error prone. Uh, what, we, what we want is the, process, the, the LDA assumes, the topic modeling problem assumes that the topics are not known. Also, when you don't even know the topics, the second thing is to, to learn that the model needs to tell you is what, if you have a topic, if you identify a topic, what are the words that specifically uh, that specify or occur at a higher probability for that topic? For example, if you take the topic of cars, uh, you would expect the name brands of cars, maybe a convertible, SUV is a word that appears. So for each topic, you also want to identify uh, the words that appear uh, or, uh, or in more uh, uh, formal language, the distribution or the probability distribution of words uh, across the entire language for each um, uh, topic. So this is called a Dirichlet prior, um, and this, this gentleman worked on this like a uh, hundred years ago, I think. Um, so in, let's say in this example, uh, we have uh, three uh, buckets of documents. It's not really bucketed, but just I've, I've shown it in that way. Now you want the topic to be identified automatically, right? So in this case, let's say you, you mentioned or you specified that this topic um, uh, is uh, this this corpus of data had had two topics. So now it's going to go through all the words in your in this corpus and understand which are the words that occur. So in this case, topic one, uh, topic one, um, uh, note, make sure understand why it's written there. So it's it's giving you the list of the words that commonly appear in topic one and uh, the the font size um, of the uh, the words that occur in topic one, right? We have organized. There is in the highest font versus direct. That's the last word in topic one. Um, the font size is here to indicate the probability distribution, right? Organized in topic one is is expected to appear a lot more than the word direct, which is which is shown in the smaller font. Similarly, in topic two. Um, you have a mercury and pollute and arsenic in slightly higher font size and lead in a lower font size. Uh, the assumption is that uh, uh, what it's trying to tell you is mercury appears a lot, uh, is expected to appear um, uh, in a uh, lot higher frequency than the word arsenic or lead. Um, um, so why do we do this? Uh, notice there are two things you need to understand of this. One is that the algorithm does not give you a name for a topic. It's only the topic one, two, and three. Um, uh, when I said a topic of philosophy, that is how, how humans name a topic. Um, in this case, in topic two, uh, it don't, did not give you a name for a topic. It only gives you a distribution, probability distribution of all the words in the language and uh, that appear in that topic. Okay. Um, notice how lead is marked in, in red color. Um, uh, and that is an important thing to note that uh, a word could appear in multiple topics. For example, in topic one, it's more about leadership, and that's the uh, intended uh, meaning of the word. Um, uh, of course, lead is also involved in uh, in poisoning, so it could appear in this topic as well. Um, however, the probability distribution it not just it depends on a single word; uh, it depends on the uh, distribution across all the words. Make sense? Right. Now, the second thing we want to do is to identify where uh, what are the topics that are associated with the document. What is it? So we need to have distribution of uh, of of each uh, the, of the probability that a document belongs to each topic. Right. So here uh, now that's the second part of the second thing that the algorithm finds. That is, um, if you if you see the arrows, um, the thickness of the arrow that is uh, that is showcased here. Uh, that is illustrated here uh, tells you the probability that it, the document belongs to a certain topic. So if you take the first topic, talking about leadership today, um, as you can see, there's a it, it belongs to the first topic more than the second topic, and so the arrow from the first topic is thicker. Right? Uh, second one, it's uh, the, it's the the second document is somewhere in the middle. The third document uh, is talking about um, uh, poisoning. 
metal poison, heavy metal poison, so that definitely belongs to topic number two. However, since it, ha it might have the word lead, um, if there is a small probability, it's, it's making uh, a guess that it's, it's belong there's a small probability of topic one in there as well. And you know, if you notice one thing, uh, this algorithm does not use, understand the meanings of words. It only uh, takes the, um, uh, the algorithm only takes the back of the words representation of documents. Uh, if you're familiar with bag of word representation, it only takes the words that occur. Um, the algorithm does not even try to understand what the documents are talking about. It only takes the occurrence of words in these documents, right? So, um, so to to summarize, the problem, this is this is the most important thing to understand the whole webinar. What that is, what is topic modeling? What is the problem space, right? So, uh, to summarize this slide, just given a set of documents. We create an unsupervised machine learning uh, uh, model, uh, a setup that is going to tell you what the topics are. Identify the topics that are latent. That's what latent uh, in LDA means. It's latent Dirichlet allocation. That is, there are hidden topics in these documents that we are trying to find out. Um, so you have to, you want to the algorithm to identify the latent uh, topics that are hidden in the documents and also. Um, tell you that the uh, what words uh, are expected in each topic. Also, as a third thing, you also want to see the uh, distribution or distribution of the topics for each document. So this is very similar to the centroid problem in the previous slide, where uh, we identified three clusters and we want to know the properties of the cluster. And then once you know the properties of the cluster, now you can classify each dot and see where it where each dot belongs. Uh, right, which which cluster each dot block. This is very similar. The the, cl the clusters are the topics, and the arrows point to uh, 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 the the probability that a document belongs to that top. Okay. Now, if you notice, um, uh, the I'm not talking about the, the algorithm itself. That that there is actually a very interesting thing about this. So we have uh, so what is the latent Dirichlet mixture model? It has two variables. This is this is important to understand. Um, just like how you had the for a centroid uh, of k-means or not for the Gaussian mixture models, you you identify the center of the clusters and you also identify the standard deviation or the 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 how closely uh, located are the data points, right? So this is the variance or the standard deviation. So you have some kind of property for each topic. So similarly, in a latent Dirichlet model, this is the most important thing to understand: the alpha and beta. Alpha is called the Dirichlet prior, uh, which which tells you that given a topic, what is the um, uh, frequency that? Um, um, hold on one second. Something popped up in my screen. All right. Uh, uh, so alpha is a prior estimate on the topic probability. That is, um, uh, what is the probability with which a, a, a document belongs to a certain topic? Right. If alpha is high, it means uh, there there is a lot of mixtures of topics. Like a single topic uh, is a single document is talking about lots of different topics. Whereas if alpha is low, it means that there is a smaller number of topics for each um, uh, for each that that each document belong uh, uh, belongs to. That is, a document is talking about only one or two or a few number of topics. That is the uh, uh, the um, um, the, the the alpha uh, property. The second uh, beta uh, that talks about the probability distribution of um, or the frequency distribution of the words that occur in a topic. Just like how we identified lead and mercury and uh, uh, poisoning as words that belong to a topic, beta talks about this. Um, uh, the when you slide beta, uh, it should tell you that a topic. Um, repres is represented by a smaller number of words versus a larger number of words. A smaller beta means uh, it is represented by a smaller number of words. So you have a really, um, let's say if it's talking about cars, you probably have cars, SUV, and maybe convertible are the three, only three words that represent uh, the, the topic. Whereas if a beta is very large, it means you have like lots of words that represent the topic. So these are the two uh, 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 properties of a dish like mixture model. It's important to understand that this actually alpha and beta are is actually the Dirichlet model, LDA. Um, um, what this is not the algorithm. It's very important to understand this. LDA 
is not an algorithm. It's more of, so when you say LDA, it's more of the problem statement or the modeling of the problem into mathematical terms. Okay? Now, what we want to do is the algorithm itself is, is called spectral decomposition for LDA. There are multiple ways to do um, uh, LDA. Um, and the um, Amazon has chosen to use what is called a spectral decomposition for LDA. Um, here is a, like a very brief uh, four lines of the algorithm. Uh, it's, it's, it's not possible for me to like, go over the algorithm itself during this webinar because that is a two hour or three hour discussion just to describe what this is doing and how it compares with the other algorithms. Uh, but, but very high level, uh, this is a high dimensional problem. Uh, the goal is to calculate the spectral decomposition. I'm, I'm going to explain to you what spectral decomposition a little bit, but you do not need to understand this to use um, LDA on a SageMaker. Um, this is all hidden for you. This is all done for you in the background. So that there are four steps. The four steps is the first is to convert the documents into a V by V by V vector tensor, um, a V where V is actually the, the vocabulary size. Um, and then you, what you do is you do a, something called a whitening matrix uh, of dimension V by K. Uh, where k is the number of topics, so that is the hyperparameter that you that you provide. Um, then you pro create a, a find a smaller k by k by k tensor, um, and last is where you do the ALS or alternate least squares to decompose the smaller k by k uh, tensor. So obviously this. I don't think uh, I explained this very well. I don't have the time to explain in this webinar. We can do a separate webinar, or there is actually a YouTube uh, recording of. Uh, of how this works. Um, there's also a reference to how LDA works or spectral decomposition works um, in the documentation link. This will be provided to you in the, in, the, um, in the slide deck after this webinar. Go ahead and, and if you're interested, you can go ahead and check it. Okay, now let's look at the last part. So what is called alternate least squares uh, for matrix decomposition. So what we did was um, we converted the document corpus into a V by V by V matrix. And then we decompose this into in a certain way so that the, the, the topics pop out, right? So uh, let's look at this. This is, this is not the, uh, this is a very, very high level representation of what it does. Um, uh, it's not a direct fit into the spectral decomposition used for LDA um, in SageMaker. But I think this should give you a good starting point to where, to where it goes. Um, this is a picture that represents um, how you separate um, uh, users and products. So, for, so we start with the left side, the orange box, right? Um, this is about uh, 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 product ratings, right, or product uh, purchase patterns. Um, uh, you have I row, I row, and J column, which means that it's set to one if a customer has bought a product. So the uh, the rows represents the column. Uh, the rows represent the uh, um, let's say it's Amazon.com, and your your each each row represents uh, a, a customer, and each column represents a product. So you, let's say I bought a book on Amazon. Um, uh, I might be the um, you know um, uh, one fiftieth customer, one uh, fiftieth row, and the column could be the book, uh, individual book could be uh, you know the millionth millionth column, and that would be set to one um, if I had purchased a book. Right. So we create a large matrix because we have millions of uh, hundreds of millions of customers and millions of products on Amazon. Right. So this is a, the left side R. Uh, that's this, the mentioned as R is a very large matrix. Um, right. And now what we want to do is uh, we want to we want to uh, convert this or decompose. It's called the technical term here is decompose. Decompose this into two different matrices. Right. Uh, so. And, and that is what becomes the right side, right? In the right side, we split this into a blue matrix and uh, a green matrix. And now the dimensions have now changed. Uh, the width of the U matrix is K, and the height of U matrix is K again. So when you multiply these two, blue and green matrix, the U, U, U cross P, um, you would automatically get R. Now it is a non-trivial process to go from R uh, equals U, U cross P. Uh, uh, because that is that is the algorithm. It needs to happen efficiently. It needs to have certain properties. So, but but the important thing is k. So k here means a user. Uh, let's say let's take the example of u, the, the matrix u. U represents users. So users can be represented in a k-dimensional vector, 
Um, and in this, and similarly, you, you do something very similar in spectral decomposition uh, uh, for uh, LDA, where this k becomes the number of topics. So the dimension of, of this uh, U matrix and P matrix, uh, the new dimension that we have added, becomes the number of topics. It, it's not exactly the same, but this is a very high level view of what is what is happening. Um, so what is shown here is not the algorithm also. Here again, it's not the algorithm. This is still the setup. So what we're doing is we took a V by V by V matrix in our uh, in our LDA, and we are going to decompose this to in a certain way so it has certain properties. Um, the algorithm is actually um, it's, is the way in which you convert the left uh, matrix and decompose the left matrix into the right matrix. That is the real algorithm, right? There are three popular algorithms: uh, Gibbs sampling. Uh, is one method, expectation uh, maximization is method, it's another method that's also popular, uh, but the Amazon SageMaker uses spectral decomposition, um, uh, that is uh, that is what we use, because that is, uh, it has some very good properties, um, these are the three properties, um, it, there are theoretical guarantees on results, the EM method, that is the expectation maximization method, um, uh, is, uh, is, is guaranteed only to converge to a local optima, um, the uh, spectral decomposition is also very parallelizable because we want scale. It's also fast, um, and so when it's fast, it's going to save customers um, a dollars um, for using this. So th it has some very nice properties. This is also mentioned in the um, uh, in the paper um, by Anima Sri Anand Kumar. She's a scientist at uh, Amazon who was uh, who's one of the uh, persons who built this algorithm for SageMaker. So uh, please uh, feel free to refer to this. Right? Now let's get back to the, um, uh, but we don't need to know all these details to use LDA, uh, to use SageMaker LDA, right? So what you need to do is uh, understand how it is used, right? Because it's all packaged nicely, you just make a few calls and then it would do it for you. So what, what you, how you actually use it, you, you start on the left side with a bunch of documents and uh, you do a data pre-processing, uh, you pre-process data because um, you cannot send words. You need to convert the words into numbers. That is, uh, you do not use uh, word to vec here or uh, blazing text. What you're doing is you reduce the number of words. You remove the words that are not necessary. For example, stop words like the, uh, in, all those things do not represent uh, topics. So you remove those words and then you bring it, uh, reduce the number of words that you need because the number, lesser the number of words, the faster the algorithm runs. Then you run the topic modeling algorithm and then you have the topics and the allocation of topics. So that's the general uh, pipeline here, okay? Uh, I want to briefly talk about the hyperparameters. Um, the, there are just three most important ones, number of topics. You need to provide the number of topics. That is not going to be, uh, it's not an open-ended uh, uh, topics. It is a specific number of topics it's going to look for. Uh, feature dimension, this is the vocabulary size. If you have 10,000 words versus 20,000 words, and a mini batch size, um, you can, uh, this, is, this is the way in which it, it, it runs the algorithm. Uh, but other other values are not are optional and are not important. So for you to be able to change other algorithms, other hyperparameters, I want you to like, really look into the algorithm and understand what it does before you do that. All right. What is the metric? I always talk about a metric uh, when talking about an algorithm. It's called PWLL. This is per word log likelihood on the data set. What this means is, um, let's say the algorithm has come up with a model, or LDA model, that is uh, topics and word distribution for each topic, um, and the topic distribution for each document. Um, what this is trying to tell is, like, given that model, if you generate the data set, how closely does that represent this corpus of data, right? So you, you see how well it matches, and that is, that is what is represented here as per word log likelihood. Okay, um, here's a sample Python pseudocode. Uh, this is just like five lines of code is all you need to understand. I'm gonna be showing you a demo very quickly. Um, so the first line is starting a section, you just copy that. The second line is creating an estimator. Um, this is to create the uh, object before you start your training job. Um, uh, and you, this is where you specify what algorithm. Here the container, not sure if you can see my mouse. Um, one of the parameters that you pass is the container name. That is where you specify the algorithm, whether it's going to be LDA or NTM or, or XGBoost or whatever, right? Um, the third is you set the hyperparameters. This is very high-city hyperparameters. Then you call fit. When you call fit, the training actually starts. You're going to be, uh, uh, SageMaker is going to be spinning up resources. And finally, once it's done, it's going to take you a certain amount of time, depending on the vocabulary size and the size of the, the, the algorithm chosen. 
Um, and finally, uh, you, you, you deploy the model to make inference, real-time inference. All right, so that's the five steps. I'm gonna show you uh, um, the, my console. So this is, this is my SageMaker, uh, this is S3, sorry. Let me know if you're not able to see this. This is my SageMaker console. I clicked on my uh, Pratap's demo. Um, it gives me this. Um, as you can see, the third tab in my Jupyter Notebook has the SageMaker examples. Um, the, when you drop down on the first one, you would see example notebooks um, in this, and I chose um, uh, LDA right here, LDA introduction. Um, this notebook then uh, is copied, and you can run this. It takes less than 10 minutes to run the whole notebook. It gives you all the details. Um, it does some pre-processing because we need uh, SciPy, that is for uh, preparing the um, uh, the the uh, the data set. Um, this notebook is actually using synthetic data. It's not using real documentation. It's generating a, a distribution of documents and then trying to learn the topics. Um, that's what it's trying to do. Uh, it's setting up first. It's it's setting up your um, execution role. I think you might be familiar with the previous um, 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 previous uh, uh, webinars. Uh, but the first part is about generating the data. Right? They they are visualizing the data. Um, um, and here's where it starts. So you from SageMaker, you import SageMaker. Um, here's where you get the container. I'm going to, I, I know, and I understand I'm going very fast. So here you create a session, uh, like I mentioned in my pseudocode, and then you create an LDA uh, estimator, where you give the uh, details about where the output path is, uh, what is this instance type to use. You set the hyperparameters. Um, here are the number of topics, the vocabulary size, the feature dimension, and the mini batch size. That's all you need to give. Um, and then you call fit. So this one took, um, I think, uh, five minutes to run. Uh, very small data size. Um, uh, only 25 words in my vocabulary, right? And the job was complete. And then I, I did a, um, an inference. I deployed. That's the last step here. Um, I deployed the model on a M4 extra large uh, with just one count. And here's where we test it, right? I'm taking the um, uh, document. Um, uh, this, in this case, the uh, topic, the number of topics I provided was five. So, given the first document, uh, it is giving me a mixture of, uh, of, of a distribution across the five topics. So, it gives me uh, three, two, zero, six, seven, zero, zero. That means uh, this document um, it has 67% uh, is talking about uh, topic number three, um, and there's 32% topic number uh, one. And it does not talk about topic two, three, two, four, and five. That's that's pretty much it. So go ahead and try it out. Um, this example notebook is available. It should take you not less than, uh, not more than ten minutes uh, to run that um, um, uh, the the algorithm. So with that, uh, I want to open up for questions. Um, and here are my details. All right, uh, Chris. Uh, let me know yeah, if there are any questions. Yeah, we, we have one here, and uh, if your notebook is still open, the question is about that. Is the, the question is, is pre-processing done automatically by LDA? Uh, but I'm not quite certain exactly which pre-processing they're referring to. Okay, good, good question. So LDA uh, does not take words as inputs. Um, it does not do any pre-processing. Um, LDA expects a large array. Right. Um, uh, by the way, LDA is not just used for topic modeling. Like I mentioned, it's used for others as well. You can use this for structured data as well. Uh, what it needs is you need to take your documents, convert this into count the number of, uh, reduce the, the words uh, in your document, um, and then create a large matrix. Like for each document, let's say you have 100,000 uh, vocabulary of 100,000 in English. Um, uh, what you need to do is for each document, create a long array and mark one wherever a word occurs, right? And mark zero when the, the word does not occur for, e, for that document. And then you create that row for each document, so now you have a large matrix. Once you have that matrix, um, uh, as given here, I'll, I'll show you this. Um, here's, here's the example document. Here they are showing about uh, 25 
uh, uh, vocabulary, this very small vocabulary, vocabulary size of just 25. As you can see, this is representing one document. So this means the first word is, is occurring 31 times here. Uh, the second, third, and fourth, and fifth word do not occur. 21 times the, the, the sixth word occur, and so on. So you need to convert your documents into a format like this, create an array of, of this, and feed that into LDA uh, algorithm. That is the pre-processing step. You, do, you probably want to pre-process some more. You don't want to remove the words that do not represent uh, a topic. For example, stop words like uh, the, and these things do not represent uh, topics. So that's where the pre-processing step could really help you in getting the right topics. So one thing to note is that the topics um, that the LDA or the, any of these algorithms, unsupervised algorithms comes up with may not align with what human beings or way we know as topics. For example, it may not come up with the, with the topics that we think are, are the right ones um, uh, because this, are, this is an unsupervised algorithm. So you may have to rerun this and fine tune the pre-processing step, add the right words to make sure that um, uh, um, the, the, the it finds the right topics. You, you cannot influence the, you cannot condition the topics to be in a certain way. This is uh, this is automatically generated. All right. Any other question? I see some more. Um, what about the clusters that do not have spherical shape? Um, so that is, um, I think that is represents the two-dimensional data. Um, you could have uh, elliptical or um, um, higher dimensional data that also would be part of the model. So, uh, so when you create a model that says you're describing the clusters, um, uh, you could have that as well. Um, you could have, uh, 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 this is just two dimensional, you can imagine how, um, how to describe this in each of the dimensions, right? So that is definitely is also um, uh, one of the aspects of the model itself. Um, and the Euclidean matrix is not applicable, that's, that's agreed. Um, does the algorithm produce topics? Um, I, I try to answer this. Um, the algorithm produces uh, topics, um, but that may or may not align with what human beings know. By topics, what it means is identifies this as topic 0, 1, 2, and 3, and each topic would, it would give you the list of words that is expected to appear uh, uh, in that topic. I think we discussed this. Another question. Um, is pre-processing done automatically by LDA? No, I think we talked about this. Um, can we do pre-preparation and processing in parallel? Uh, no, you have to pre-process the data um, and store it in S3 and then call uh, SageMaker. That is uh, separate because this is a job training job submission. It takes um, it takes the data from S3. So you can, yeah. Uh, you can, if you are running multiple uh, training sessions, you could do this, but it is generally not recommended. Um, any other specific question, um, uh, Chris? Yeah, we just got a few in. I'm not sure if there was a, a buffer issue or what, but they just they just came in. There was uh, here's a good one. How do we see the list of words uh, that describe a topic? I'm sorry. Say that again. It, how do we, how do you see the list of words that describe a topic? So when it gives you a topic, it's going to give you a distribution, right? For their entire vocabulary, um, it's for each topic you're going to see an array for the entire vocabulary. Um, let's say if it's ten thousand, and this vocabulary is going to have numbers. Like if you add the entire thing, it would add up to some uh, some of one. Um, and for the words that are supposed to appear, you would see non-zero numbers, right? For example, let's say for example the word um, uh, metry, lead, and the poisoning. Um, these are the words which would have non-zero probabilities. The other words would have a zero probability of zero or close to zero. So that is how the topics would, would show up. Okay. Here's another one. Um, can we get the priority or the importance of topics found in a single document? Yes. So for each document, you would get a distribution, probability distribution across the topics. Um, for example, let's say if you assigned, um, and we saw in this notebook example as well. Um, uh, let me scroll down. Um, when you do an inference, 
Um, I'm sending, uh, hold on, I'm trying to see where I live. Yes, here, here you go. So I'm, I'm doing a prediction on the uh, deployed model um, and I'm sending the first document. And you can see that it's giving you a distribution, probability distribution across the five topics. In this case, I specified the topics to be five. And there's a 67 percent uh, uh, words represent are from topic number three, and 32 uh, percent are from topic number one. So that is the distribution that you get. Make sense? All right. Next question. Yeah, here's an interesting one. Does it make sense during the pre-processing to not only uh, remove the words with low frequency, but also the words with extremely high frequency? I think he's going for some type of normalization effect here. Yes, yes, you should do that. That That is highly uh, uh, recommended. Uh, for example, uh, words like a, and the, I mean, the word the appears like 7% in the entire uh, English uh, language uh, or corpus. So you probably want to remove that because you're adding your when you remove the words that that occur commonly um, what it what it helps is it reduces the number of dimensions or the vocabulary size um, so that's going to make it faster one the second thing is the word the uh, and and these are called top words in NLP um, they really do not help you in identifying the topics right so the topics are represented by more specific terms right uh, for example lead and poisoning um, those are the kinds of topics that that really represent the topics the word these kinds of words do not represent and there's a very specific way to remove them it's called tsidf pre-processing step um, uh, what that takes is it takes the uh, the entire corpus identifies the number of times a word occurs and sees if uh, if that word occurs in your near corpus and removes them so you can use a, a what is called a tsidf a method um, to remove all those uh, uh, occurring words However, I don't think you should remove the words that occur that do not uh, that occur very uh, infrequently. Those are the words that could represent the topic. So you do not want to remove the words uh, that occur that are not common. So that is the recommendation for topic modeling for pre-processing for the topic model. And then here's a, another good one that I, I missed. I do apologize. They all streamed in here very quickly. Uh, how does LDA handle large data, and can it take sparse matrix? Um, so you say that again. How does the LDA algorithm handle large amounts of data, and can it take sparse matrix? Um, so the way um, I think I see another example also here. There are like thousand pages in my document. How does it? Um, <coughs> uh, how do, how does it uh, <coughs> take in large uh, data? Um, the data is when, when according to um, uh, for the LDA, it does not look at the document, right? Each document is represented by this by the, by the same uh, by a, by an array of the same size. Whether you could have a document that's one pages, and you could have a document with thousand pages. Um, both of these documents are represented by one array, um, where where the vocabularies the, the the, the, there's, you increase the count of the words, number of times a word occurs in that array, right? So let me show you in that notebook. So the, it, the size of the document is, is matters only during the pre-processing step, uh, but does not really matter uh, for the algorithm itself. Let me give you examples. Here's the example, right? In this case, each document is represented by a vocabulary size of 25. This is a very extreme example, very small uh, dimensional. Usually you can expect 1,000 or, or, or 10,000 words. Um, this 25 uh, words is what it represents. This could be a very large document, but what it's saying is the first word occurs 31 times, second, fifth word occurs 21 times, and 42 times. Uh, it does not matter if the document is large or wrong. What really matters is the vocabulary size. You got to be very careful of the vocabulary size. If that blows up, because it's a V by V by V matrix that starts with, um, so that's a very large matrix. If you have like 10,000, if you can somehow bring it down to 1,000, your algorithm will run much faster because it's a cube, um, uh, it's a cubic tensor, so our tensor of rank three. So that is a, that is what it matters. Uh, document size really does not matter. You can use uh, popular open source tools like NLTK, um, uh, or there's a newer tool called Spacey uh, for for the pre-processing step that would efficiently work on your documents to create these kinds of um, uh, uh, vocabulary or bag of words representation. So that should not be a, that should be fairly easy. You don't have to write uh, a Python code for that. There, there are there are very popular 
uh, mature open source projects that are available to help you do that. Okay, any other questions? Yeah, there was <clears throat> there's one here. I, I accidentally answered it privately, so we'll throw it out there so that the whole crowd can hear. Uh, does it work for all languages or just English? Um, very good question. Does the word um, uh, are these words in English or in other languages? Um, the example shown here, um, actually, the LDA does not know what the words mean or even the spelling of the meanings, right? Um, you define the vocabulary, right? The vocabulary could be French, German, or English. It doesn't matter. As you can see, all it takes, all LDA takes, is an array of numbers, right? It only knows that, hey, this is word number one, word number six, word number 10, word number 14, and so on. Um, it does not really, uh, uh, the LDA actually does not even see the words. Um, so it is during the pre-processing step that you convert the vocabulary into numbers, right, um, or indexes in this array. Um, so, so one point to be noted here is that when you're dealing with uh, uh, with Chinese or Japanese, which tend to have a very large number of words because everything has its own, um, um, I think that's a large number of characters. Um, I think the vocabulary size might be different. So you might want to uh, be careful when you're using the Chinese or Japanese or or languages that belong in that uh, in, in in that family. Um, you want to be you want to be careful about how you pre-process. But there are open source tools to handle Chinese and Japanese and those kinds of languages. Uh, you can use that. That's a very good question, though. Any other questions? Yeah, I just got one. Just we got, uh, looks like we got time for one more. Uh, is gone, go, went the same word? So uh, it looks like it's a question about you know the, the tense, past, present, and future tenses of words. Uh, so it's asking if LDA understands conjugation. Yes. Okay. That's also another very good question. So I really like these questions because this is talking about the pre-processing step, and that is where you need to be focusing on, right? Um, so the question is about, let's say you have a word, um, uh, let's say um, a gone, a go, gone, or went. Um, these are past, past tense, and, and uh, uh, maybe even going future tenses of the same word. Um, that is a really uh, important thing to think about, saying that um, does, uh, this could be represented in multiple words, right? Each word could be represented as a separate word, or this could represent, uh, could be uh, uh, converted into the root word. So there's, this, there's something called uh, lemmatization in the natural language processing uh, terminology, um, uh, where you take the word and you actually go to the root of the word and you represent that. This actually does two things. One is, that the number of vocabulary, the vocabulary size decreases, right? If you if you don't represent this by like five words and 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 go to the root word, so it becomes one. So the you are reducing the vocabulary by a factor of five. That is a huge uh, improvement. That would lead to a huge improvement in the, the the speed of the algorithm and the time it takes to converge. Number two, the accuracy of your algorithm also could improve. Um, the reason I say this is this. Um, uh, when you, you use five words to represent the same thing, like go, going, went, uh, um, or will go, these things, right? So when you convert this and make it to the same word, and you count this as five times of the same word, rather than one time of each word, um, the algorithm is now able to understand that this word occurs five times, um, and is able to associate all the occurrence to the same root word. So LDA will actually be able to give you better topics, and better topic distributions because of this pre-processing step. However, uh, there, is, there is a catch to this. This is, a, this is probably the most important thing to note. You have to be careful there are, about the way, the tool that you use to make these, uh, this transformation, right? Um, uh, it's not a broadly applicable. You cannot apply uh, the technique, the way in which you go to the root word uh, that is used in one, one uh, industry and apply it to on something else. You have to be careful about how the words are transformed, how you approach the root word. There are multiple different algorithms. For example, the way Stacy uh, is an open source toolkit uh, does this versus the way NLTK, which is a much more mature uh, toolkit for natural language does it, are different. And there are lots of options in this as well. So you have to be careful about how you do this. You want to test it and see if you're getting the right kind of transformation of the words. Uh, before you even start the LDA algorithm training. 
that's a very good question. That is the right right thing to think about and right uh, uh, approach uh, to to actually using LDA effectively. Yeah. So one one more um, and it's sort of a recap question. Uh, Pratap, could you could you quickly um, run down the list again of some of the um, the pre-processing tools you had mentioned? I know you had mentioned NLTK, you had mentioned Spacey. Uh, so maybe if you could just mention those one more time for folks to, yes. uh, to make a note of those. Uh, yes. Um, I'm going to uh, create a new slide here so that people can. Even even better. Yeah. Then we'll distribute these um, this slideware after the webinar. So no need to yes. uh, no need to grab a pen and paper. For top got you covered. All right. So these are the two uh, words. I think it's spacey. I'm not 100% sure about the uh, 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 the spelling, but if you search for Spacey in natural language, uh, you should be able to get it. So these are the two popular um, uh, toolkits. NLTK actually is NLP toolkit. That's a natural language toolkit is what it stands for, um, and Spacey. There is a very popular uh, YouTube video on Spacey. Um, that describes how Spacey works and how Spacey is different. The parser in Spacey is different from NLTK, and the transformations and lemmatization can be done differently. So yeah, I would recommend that you listen to those and, and refer to those before you choose your uh, your toolkit. It, it's not going to take you a lot of time. Um, these are toolkits you just like install this and start using it on your documents. Um, these toolkits usually come with its own data sets for sample data sets, um, so you can even try that on that and, and do lots of different things. Very easy to use tools. All right. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Pratap. Excellent presentation as always. I'm gonna I'm gonna hand it back over to Sue so she can close this out. Hey guys, that was awesome. I learned a lot and appreciate it. And hopefully everybody else did too. Um, you're going to get an email follow-up from this call. It will have the recording, so if you want to go back and just kind of look through anything that Pratap talked about, um, get a little bit more information, you are welcome to do that. Also, feel free to share that with your colleagues. You will also get a link to our next webinar, um, which off the top of my head is early November, but I can't think of the date at the moment. So um, hopefully you are going to sign up for the next couple of webinars that we're running, one in November, one in Dece December, and then we um, we go right into January. So thanks everybody. Hope you have a great rest of your day and we'll see you in a couple weeks.